All right, welcome everyone to today's webcast. My name is Jessica Gopalakrishnan, and I will be your host for today. Today's session is titled Reducing Errors and Rework uh, Project Efficiency. So during the next 30 minutes, we will be exploring ways to make building projects smoother, faster, and more efficient. Uh, this is a pressing topic, and because of this, we definitely encourage all of you to participate as much as possible. Send us your questions and comments in the questions box, which is located to the right of your screen there. Following the session, we will send you an email that contains a link to the recording of the presentation and a link to a survey, so you can give us feedback, and that feedback will help us improve future sessions. Um, if you would like to tweet during the session, please use the hashtag ARC webcast so we can keep all of that, all those tweets and good information together. And uh, let's get going with our session today. So our speakers uh, today are Dan Gowan and David Godfrey. Dan has uh, 28 plus years experience in broad spectrum construction, spanning commercial, industrial, and residential projects. So for this past seven years, he's been immersed in construction technology, from deploying iPads, setting up technology and job site trailers, to laser scanning, BIM coordination, and software implementation. Welcome, Dan. Thanks. Uh, we also have David Godfrey. Dave has worked with some of the largest construction deployment architects in the Southeast US region over the last three years. And he's very passionate about bringing technology to the industry to help improve project efficiency and productivity. Hi, Dave. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everybody. All right, thank you both for joining us today. Let's get started here. So first, I thought we'd start off with talking about some of the challenges and projects. What do project teams face today? They're real challenges. Okay, Jessica. Um, so a lot of the um, challenges that we see are, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with, is um, Budgets and tight budgets and you know tight schedules. So the owners they want the buildings done, projects done as quick as possible, uh, but they don't want to give you very much money to do that, right? Um, a lot of challenges we see there's low profit margins uh, for both the GCs and the subcontractors, and that leaves very little room for um, errors and mistakes. Um, the other challenge we see is inexperienced and unskilled labor. Um, the workforce out there is not like it was when I started 28 years ago, for sure, where, you know, it seems like a lot of people back then took a little bit more pride in their work, um, had a little bit more knowledge of uh, the types of work they were doing. And that gives a, a big challenge where the GCs have to do a lot more babysitting, a lot more watching the projects, being out in the field a lot more uh, than in the past when I first got into the industry. Um, Dave, what areas of are your clients seeing and experience with the most? I'd say, of course, a lot of the clients that I work with, uh, they're seeing uh, lack of skill when it comes to the trades. Uh, but more particularly, I'd say that uh, on the tech side, um, I work with a lot of different GCs that uh, they want to adopt technologies that some of their competitors might be adopting, but finding people on staff who are really adopting of those technologies. Um, you know, people who want to carry an iPad around and use those to, to do punch us, uh, it's pretty scarce. I mean, they might have signed uh, an intern or one of the younger guys on tech. But then also, uh, more as of late, I've seen a lot of companies struggle with finding people uh, to help them on BIM. Um, when it comes to finding people who are well-versed or able to handle coordination, modeling, and all that. So a lot of the clients that I'm working with um, are looking to more outsource uh, that kind of works. Definitely on the BIM side, I'm seeing a lot more um, struggles with some of the GCs in terms of that experience. Okay. Uh, one of the things also that I saw a lot was uh, labor shortages. So uh, I know we struggled when I was in the GC world uh, with subcontractors, just finding a subcontractor to do some of the simple work. And the subcontractors struggled with finding people for their own. But the GCs also struggled um, finding people that are qualified. Uh, one of the big things I think contribute to this is vocational schools and the high school level kind of uh, disappeared. I know at least in my area in the East Coast, um, the big push to go to college and, and have a, a, a career in that kind of industries where the trades aren't really looked upon as they used to be. Um, 
So that, that provides us a big shortage and, and then again, the struggle for the GCs to be able to get the work done on that time matter. Um, and then the complication of the project designs themselves, right? Um, the types of materials that are used nowadays. Uh, no, again, in my area, a lot of blast proof type um, window assemblies and curtain wall assemblies and the types of architectural designs that are currently now, uh, BIM and 3D modeling allow us to create a lot more things that come to mind. Well, we still got to build those things. So next slide. Okay. I've lost my last one. All right. So let's get into uh, some of the discussion points here. The first off here is high performing teams are well informed. Dan, you want to talk a little bit about this and why it's important? Sure. So again, it's important to, to overcome the challenges that we're talking about, um, to come up with some sort of way for your document management to be uniformed, right? So again, that design phase, um, bid phase, and then through the construction and then you have the turnover phase, it's having everybody on the same page as far as uh, document management is concerned. Uh, one of the challenges you have different types of systems is being able to pull and keep updated sets of drawings and things like that. So being able to early on establish the type of uh, system you are going to have to manage all your documents and make sure everybody's on board with that. Um, again, your GCs, your owners, uh, subcontractors, having everybody buy into the type of system you're using. What are some of the owners saying to you, Dave? Well, from a lot of my owners and uh, development clients, I'd say some of the biggest struggles um, is definitely having uh, it seamless where uh, the GC has their current set or their drawings in one platform. They struggle with having uh, to keep up with their own drawings, the architects. Um, they're seeing a lot of situations where, you know, maybe someone has something on an internal server that it has to be transferred over to a cloud storage. There's a, there's a huge disconnect um, between a lot of my clients and some of the GCs they're working with. Um, there hasn't been particularly you know, too many platforms um, that really have uh, both the owner and uh, the GC and the projects teams uh, the kind of flexibility that would support them all, um, which is why they're trying to work a lot more uh, with us. Yes, absolutely. Again, you know, having that um, uniform uh, way of being able to manage all that. Uh, for example, like latest sets of project docs, right? Your latest set of drawings. Um, who has access to that? Does the subcontractors utilize that? Are they maintaining their own set? Is the, you know, the CM on the job, is he maintaining their set? And then the owner, what do they have that they're looking at? So trying to have a place to have everything in one location and being able to update that all as fast as possible. Um, again, I can't tell you how many times we out in the field. You kind of you, you've been in meetings. You've heard that there's an RFI coming. You know it's probably been approved, but you're still looking at something that's been you know the wrong way that you've been trying to work around for weeks, and to have that information sitting on somebody's desk just because it hasn't been posted yet um, is crazy. And or maybe it's posted to the latest set that is in the trailer, but the people in the field don't have access to it on their iPad or their phone. So again, making sure you have you know a way to keep all that in one central location, and be able to have as real time as possible updates. Great. Next slide. All right, we've got reducing time for turnover process. So how will this help project teams, and how do they go about doing it? Good question. So um, again, as built during the project. Um, so basically what that is, is I've seen a lot of times, again, back in the paper world and even now in, in the more of the technical world, the technology world, is especially some contractors, but GCs are just as guilty as this, is keeping an updated set. So what the meaning of that is, you know, how many times where your subcontractor, they go do all the work and then they pull off the job because they're done and you have to chase them and to say, hey, where's your ass built? You know, I need a marked up set of drawings of how you put the footers in for the concrete and things like that. Trying to reinforce that they need to do that as they're building. That's why it's called as built. Same thing with the, you know, as a GC, going into the trailer or, or marking up electronically or however, as you know, you construct the project. That way everybody knows how it's built 
real time. Maybe there's a problem with the way it's being put in that it could be caught by updating as posts as you go. And then waiting to the end to do all that, that's just delay of getting off the job, right? Moving on to your next project. Um, receiving closeout documents, that's huge. So again, you know, a job that's 18 months long, you know, you could be on there for months trying to gather all your owner's manuals and all your as-built drawings and all your documentation. Well, a lot of times, part of the submittal package, that should be included. If it's not, then, you know, getting it from the subcontractors as they're doing the work or especially as soon as they finish, right? A lot of subs finish months, sometimes maybe a year before the job's done, but don't wait till then to chase them down. You know, trying to make sure you have all your closeout documents as real time as possible, um, just make you get off the job faster. And that's where you can actually, you know, start making up some of the uh, shortfalls of the profit margins. Yeah, when it comes to uh, reducing time from the turnover, it goes hand in hand with uh, reducing uh, the different number of platforms uh, and, and tools used, uh, really consolidating the process uh, on the field. I mean, I've heard way too many situations where the GC is on one platform, they have to archive on a different platform, it's not seamless, which just extends the process of getting all the necessary documentations and everything from the owners. Um, I mean, Dan, you know, how many, you know, do you have any experience with projects where uh, you've had multiple platforms? And I'd imagine it was a headache. Absolutely. I can't tell you how many times where the project starts off, you know, the bid phase, you're getting all your bid documents in and, you know, you start going to the job, you're using one platform, you know, maybe it's a, a paper or maybe it's a, some sort of technology you're using. And then midway through the job, you know, the team gets bigger, they implement some other type of solution. And then especially to close at the final, you're doing punch list and some other solution gets put in there. And next thing you know, you have, three different drawings and three different platforms. You don't know which one's the latest one. You got people using one you know, set of documents on one platform because it's easier to use on a type of device maybe. And then the trailer has this type of platform being used and the office is using that platform. And then the owner, you know, the poor owner, they're using maybe still paper and <laughs> there's no consistency, right? So again, trying to have that one place, that one sense of truth, all the documents go into, you know, this makes your job run a lot smoother and faster. Fantastic. That's some really great advice. And actually, I have a poll that I'm going to put up here uh, real quick. And it's going to be, how often do you encounter delays due to not receiving updates in a timely manner? So here you go. Here's the poll. Is it 90 to 100 percent of the time or 0 to 30 percent of the time at the low end? Go ahead and click on one of those buttons. Looks like most people are clicking the 50 to 70% of the time. 80, um, 90% people are right in that middle there. All right, I'm gonna close that poll and actually I think I can share the results here so you guys can see. There you go. And I'm going to uh, move to the next slide now. All right, so defining a timeline for document posting. What's important right. about this? So what's important about this is, again, establishing parameters um, early on, again, like we were talking about. So coming up with a timeline of RFIs, for example. So if I submit or not, you know, who's going to submit the RFI? You can allow the subcontractors to submit the first question, the GC. And then the process of getting the RFI answered and then establishing a timeline early on. You know, so many times I've seen where an RFI could go on for weeks where, you know, again, you're going to have some complicated ones, right? It's going to take some time. But some of the simpler ones, you know, they shouldn't be lasting weeks. But establish that early on with your design team, your owners, and have everybody buy into what the expected time frame of an RFI answer is. Same thing with some middles, you know, having set times of, you know, Build that into your schedules, right? So if a submittal is going to – approval time is a month for every submittal, whatever it is, week, whatever. Build that into your schedule. Again, I can't tell you how many times we're going to – you know, we're on a job site and we're putting work in place and the submittals aren't even turned in. Or maybe they're sitting in some design team's desk. You know, that's huge problems, you know. And, again, that's just nothing but cost to the GC, cost to the owner, cost to the subcontractors of not having the right materials you're putting in place. Um, 
again, it's very critical. And then enforcement, so have some sort of force, enforcement mechanism and talk about that early on. Don't, you know, don't wait till a submittal came in too late and you're arguing back and forth whether you should have it or not and try to enforcing that, come up with all the parameters beginning at the project and everybody's on the same page. Um, and then making sure everybody's held accountable. Again, you know, don't be scared to have those conversations with the owner himself. A lot of times the design team and the owner sometimes are at fault for all these delays. Put them on, you know, on notice, document that, you know, again, when the end of the day comes and you end up being late on schedule like that, have no, bring that up, create a log and have that information in your hand. Uh, what are some of the clients saying about Calendly to you, Dave? Uh, it's mission critical. Um, there's way too many situations where a GC has to deal with a subcontractor who said he was waiting and working off the uh, latest set of drawings, but he really wasn't. Uh, being able to track that information, being able to actually pull a report that says, you know, RFIs were answered or created, and not have to chase down an email for documentation, not have to actually chase down emails to see whether some middles were approved, uh, being able to go through a workflow, all that kind of stuff really extends itself to accountability. When you have accountability, it protects you know the parties involved in projects. So it is, it's very critical to a lot of the projects and a lot of my clients are asking for and the tools they use is, is being able to track uh, for accountability. All right, fantastic. Next slide. Scalability of solutions for project size. So why is this important to project teams? Yeah, so when it comes to a solution that a company is going to implement, uh, they're looking, and a lot of my clients are looking for a solution that doesn't just fit a project that might have a huge budget. It might be something also that has a tight budget something that fits uh, different terms, whether it's a long-term project or a, sh a short-term project, uh, being able to integrate into something they've already built. If someone has um, invested in either a cloud or their internal servers, they want something seamless where it can work during a project, but then it can also work with what I've already established. Maybe some of my clients have already established uh, an automatic archiving to one of the cloud services that they subscribe to, rather than having to abandon that, but a, a, a solution that fits in, more of a plug-in, but can also take the entire range of what they're doing. So really being seamless into what they're archiving. Um, so scalability is a huge portion of uh, what companies are looking for when it comes to a solution uh, for their projects. Thank you. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Yes. All right. So the next one we have here is defining team roles and processes. Okay. So again, designating a project team member um, early on or members of your team. So again, at the early stages when you're deciding what kind of system you're going to use and the processes is designating members within the project of the roles. So again, you got to, I don't know, who's going to be in charge of posting the RFI? Who's going to be in charge of creating your you know, as-built set? Who's going to be chasing the subcontractors for all their closeout procedures? And then establishing that with the subcontractor. Who, are the sub, who on the subcontractor's team is going to be accountable and the go-to person for the closeout information or for the submittals? Um, who on the design team is going to be responsible for you know, managing the RFIs? Uh, is there like a central person? Is it going to be, you know, you got to have those go-to people that, and for the accountability part and just to get the job done faster. Um, and also incorporate a service. Um, that's something that, we, you know, definitely we can help out, help you on is having a service that help manage and maintain your documents. Um, and then having, again, like we talked about before, having a designated, you know, process for your submittals and RFIs. Um, what are your clients asking for in this as well, Dave? Yeah, I mean, I would say from a couple of years back when we first started on some of our platforms, uh, companies were asking for workflows, uh, a workflow where if someone originates a submittal item that it can go on to different approvals. Uh, so actually just released a uh, submittals workflow and really tailored to having 
an actual workflow, not just I send a submittal item, I put it back, I send it on to the next person, but actually have it go through a process, go through specific different companies and specific approvals, and then all uh, every, everyone getting a notification once that submittal item is over, which extends itself uh, to the accountability side is what a lot of our clients were asking for. Okay. And then another way would be tracking of subcontract activity during a project. So, you know, having a solution that can do a, maybe a activity daily, a daily activity report of access, right? You know, how many people on the job that day access the current set of drawings? You know, if you go with that report and say, you know what, Mr. Drywall guy, you haven't looked at the current set of drawings in over a week, that might be a problem. Um, you know, see who's accessing the submittals. I mean, how many times you you do it, do all the work of submitting the submittals and getting it out there, but nobody ever opens it up and makes sure that it's being followed. I mean, I used to see that all the time. Um, and then photo management, that's a huge one. Everybody has a smartphone on the job site now. Everybody has a tablet that takes photos, and everybody's taking photos from your owners to everybody, right? Subcontractors. But what are they doing with them? Are they just sitting on somebody's phone? Are they sitting on somebody's computer? You know, there's some system somewhere that only certain people have access to. You know, have a place to have you know full access of all those photos, and have a place, have a way to, you know, link those to a drawing, link them to areas, um, have them searchable. There's, it's huge. You know, how many times you've taken pictures? Eighteen months later, somebody asks you, "Hey, there was a rebar put into that CMU wall?" Well, I thought I took a picture, but you just can't find it, right? So now you're paying for scanning to be done just to verify, you know, that there's rebar in that wall. Things like that. Just having a way to um, manage your pictures in an easy-to-use way. Uh, what do you see as far as that's concerned, Dave? Uh, I, I agree. I mean, when it comes to, you know, daily photos, being able to organize everything, have a custom folder structure, not just uh, have photos on, on one device that are only synced to that device, but have everything continuous. I mean, it's not like everyone always brings their tablet to the job site. You might have situations where you might only have your phone, but still have the kind of capability that I might have on my tablet where I can take a progress photo or I can attach a photo to maybe a punch list item and not have to go to that specific punch list item to find that photo, but maybe that photo is automatically placed somewhere or we actually have a way to automate all photos placed into the gallery. All that metadata searchable, which really... Uh, benefits because rather than having to search through folders and having to find a photo, I mean, you can't find and search photos unless metadata is attached to it. So that's one of the big uh, pieces of photo management, and it is critical to every job. Yep. Uh, next slide, Jessica. Okay. This one is becoming more and more critical it's about being cloud based and mobile. Absolutely. So again, everybody on the job site, for the most part, has a mobile device, right? A lot of them are personal devices. You know, there's different, you know, Android, iOS. Um, having access to some sort of platform that can support all those types of devices is huge. It's really important. But have a way where the person who has the device can select what they need to have access to. So, for example, you know, the drywall guy, maybe he doesn't want to have the electrical drawings. Maybe there's no need for him to carry it around with him in his tool belt to copy the electrical drawings. So he can select that he only wants to use the architectural drawings, for example. Um, and, again, having access on a mobile device where there's no Internet connection. So a lot of times, a lot of solutions, you know, rely on the Internet. And, again, I've worked in the Washington, D.C. market for many, many years. And I can tell you, after a certain time of day, especially in the summer, the internet coverage just doesn't exist, right? All the population of all the tourists come in there and all the LTE coverage just goes away. So if you're relying on your mobile device to have some sort of cellular coverage, it just doesn't exist. So what do you do? You just go back to paper? I mean, it defeats the purpose, right? So having a way so your mobile devices can have that connectivity. Or work, if you're working in a basement and you want to get your latest drawing, but you know it just got posted, but you can't get it because you're in the basement. You got to come out. Um, but it's, it's also important is the syncing capability of the solution you use. Um, I can't tell you any time some of the solutions I've used in the past where it has a select button or something you've got to push to sync. You know, you're at the critical stage of the project. You're at the punches stage. You got maybe three or four people punching. You got two, three hundred items you're punching out, putting on a list a day, and it's a Friday afternoon. 
and the team is working with you, is punching, and a member of that team goes to the beach for the week. Takes their iPad, puts 200 issues on there with photos. It's real critical to get it to the subs. And they put in their truck, and they go to the beach and forget to hit the one little button. And now your whole week of all that data is gone. You don't have access to it. So having some sort of platform that is smart enough to know that, hey, there's internet connection. Let's go ahead and update the server, and the server can be pushed back down to the device. Um, again, ability to all types and types of platforms. You know, some people you have Android, some people have iOS. Being able to be cross-platform, and again, complete offline and online access. Uh, next slide. Training and implementation. So the type of you know system that you decide to use, one of the, the most critical I think I would say is the, the ease of use, the training of it. You can spend lots of money on some sort of system that promises to do everything in the world, but if it's too complicated to use, it just will not be used. I mean that's as simple as it is, especially in the construction industry. You know, again, like we've been saying, you know, it's hard enough to build a building and get it done on time and on budget. And then have to mess around some complicated software you don't know what to do and don't know what to push and it's, it takes too long to actually update the drawing set things like that but also have a way to the solution that you choose is having the backing having somebody that can come out and teach the team members of how to use it but not just the gcs again we're saying that you should have everybody on board the owners the architects subcontractors and each one of those entities has different um, need within the system and different expertise levels when it comes to this IT in general. So maybe a subcontractor's never even used a computer and this is his first job on the you know out there using the technology. So that kind of training is be catered to that type of person. Where maybe the design team are very familiar with computers, use systems like the system that you chose to use. So this needs a little bit of training. So having a company that could, you know, cater to that type of training also, but also be able to come on do it online or do it in real time in the person. But well, I guess what I'll leave you at is think about this: if a system that you cho do choose costs, I don't know, a thousand, twelve hundred dollars for one day of training on site, maybe that system is too complicated to use. If it costs twelve hundred dollars for somebody to come out there for eight hours and train twenty to thirty people, I would argue that that system is very complicated and you know doesn't need to be utilized. Again, you're already struggling in all the things we talked about, and you don't want to be bogged down in some complicated type of system. Next slide. All right. So using technology in the business development process. This is an interesting one. Yeah. So, of course, you have uh, the aspect of using technology uh, when you're building a project to help and to improve the product as a whole. I think some, some firms, and really when we start talking to them about ways to win projects using technology really um, six and when I say that I'm talking about you know when you're in the interview process uh, let's say you have a, a dashboard using using a dashboard as a project um, as a landing page for project for the turnover phase like you see on the slide there uh, instead of you know hard set or CD and of course you know it's dependent on the project if it's required hard set or not but if you can go to a GC I mean if you go to an owner and say that rather than handing you a flash flash drive or a hard drive that has just a bunch of PDFs and someone's going to have to go through manually and look at all the drawings, try and find something. If I can show an owner, let's say at a school or at a hospital, that by clicking on this section here, I can find the water shutoff valve, or if I have a situation where I really need to find uh, my assets, my drawings, my O&M information, all that kind of stuff can really help the business development process as a competitive differentiator, which is huge when it comes to winning projects. You have that aspect of the business development process that technology can help. And you also have, of course, BIM uh, when it comes to using uh, things like virtual reality, when it comes to construction sequencing to show how show an owner how the project is going to be built, the phases. All that stuff really ties into business development and winning projects. Then, of course, you also have um, using a dashboard for prospects while others pro other projects are in progress. I know, Dan, you can speak to this specifically. I'm sure you've had a situation or two where this would actually um, extend itself. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, um, a dashboard, you know, if you're doing like, um, you know, building a, I don't know, multi-tenant building or maybe residential and having some sort of dashboard linked to a web page where prospective tenants could just uh, click on there and track progress of, you know, the spaces that they want or, you know, that they sign up for. Um, again, just being able to have real-time access, it, you know, it's all about, you know, mobility or whatever it is, is having that access as quick as possible and not have to search for it. And I think it all really comes full circle if you consider, you know, using a dashboard, for instance, uh, in the business development process, you're going to end up using it in the project phase as well. So you're kind of setting up the project for success while still helping yourself in the interview process and winning a project by using technology like this. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, that actually concludes our webcast for today. There was so much valuable information in here, you guys. Thank you so much, Dave and Dan. That was really excellent. We do have to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, you know, we want to try to take a few questions. Carrie, did any questions come in? I have. Um, so we have a couple of questions. The first is, uh, you showed a dashboard. Can we see how this works? And you want to take on that? Um, sure, I don't have access to the actual dashboard itself. Yeah, I would say if you want to email us at this email uh, address right there, solutions at eARC.com, and um, we'll be happy to set up a, a call for you, a meeting, discuss um, your needs, and then set up a, a demo for you. Does that sound good? Any other questions, Carrie? Um, the, next, the next question is, uh, for those dashboards, can they be customized? Yes, absolutely. Um, again, the background, as you see right there, um, we can change the background to whatever project, you know, the building, the rendering of the building was finished, or maybe different stages of the building is fine. Uh, you'll see where you can put your custom logo. So the dashboard can be, you know, something the design team creates or the GC or, you know, However you decide, it's pretty much unlimited. Great, and that's it for what I have questions that have been typed in. All right, great. Well, we've run out of time now. Thank you again, Dave and Dan, for presenting today. Thank you to our audience for joining us. And as a final reminder, please take a look at the web link for upcoming sessions for this week. And uh, thank you again for attending. We'll be in touch with you soon. Take care.